This is Agriculture Today, and I'm Shelby Varner with the K-State Radio Network. The show begins with Tyler Cousins, an agricultural economist with the Livestock Marketing Information Center, with a cattle market update. He gives a cattle market recap and then talks beef and cattle trade. The Beef Cattle Institute's Brad White and Bob Larson keep today's show rolling with an episode of their Bovine Science podcast, where they talk about the potential impacts of stress on reproduction. Joe Gherkin, K-State Fisheries and Aquatics Extension Specialist, ends the show by discussing the recent finding of an American eel in the Kansas River, which hasn't happened for about 10 years. That and more is coming up ahead on Agriculture Today. You're tuned in to Agriculture Today, and we start our Monday show with a cattle market update. And this week, we're joined by agricultural economist at the Livestock Marketing Information Center, Tyler Cousins. Tyler, thanks for joining us today. Thanks, Shelby. Glad to be here. Tyler, talking about the cattle market, and first, just giving a recap of what it's been doing. Yeah, so so looking specifically at the Dodge City, uh, Kansas feeder cattle market, uh, looking at the steer side of things overall compared to the prior week, Lighter weight steers weighing less than 800 pounds sold higher. Prices for steers weighing over 800 pounds were steady to slightly lower than the prior week. So looking a little bit closer at those uh, specific weight groups for feeder steers, the 5 to 600 pound steers were up about $15 from last week to 315. 6 to 700 pound steers were $5 uh, higher over last week to 291. 7 to 800 pound steers were $12 higher uh, last week to 270. 8 to 900 pound steers remain close to last week's price of around 250. Then those 900 to 1,000 pound steers held steady at uh, 229. Now, if we switch over to the heifer side of things, um, looking at the weight groups there, 500 to 600 pound heifers uh, were, were up slightly about $1 from last week to 273. Six to 700 pound heifers hit um, 260. That's up about $11 from last week. Seven to 800 pound heifers decreased almost $10 from last week to 233. Then eight to 900 pound heifers were down about $3 from last week to 224. So overall prices for lightweight feeder steers and heifers showed improvement over last week. Uh, but this is in contrast to a weaker tone for heavier weight feeder steers and heifers. Now switching gears and looking at the fed cattle side of things, uh, looking at the five area average live prices for uh, steers and heifers, USDA reported negotiated cash prices for steers and heifers range from, we're, t- we're in the upper $180 area. That's about even with uh, uh, what we saw last week, but maybe a slightly weaker weaker tone than what we would have expected. Now, compared to last year, though, fed cattle prices are tracking about six to seven dollars higher. Fed cattle prices have been holding steady in the one hundred and eighty dollar range for several weeks now. This is about ten to fifteen dollars higher than where prices were at this time last year. I would argue a positive sign as we head into the summer months. Now, looking at prices on a dress basis, steers and heifer prices are steady to slightly lower by about one to $2 from last week, but still around that $300 level. Compared to a year ago, dress prices are about 10 to $12 higher. Now looking at uh, box feed prices, specifically choice box feed prices, these are steady to, these showed a steady improvement compared to last week. Prices range from about 314 to 316 through the week, which is up about one to $2 from what, last week and about $6 higher than where prices were last year. Now looking at the specific primal values, support for the cutout value came uh, specifically from gains in the rib, chuck, round, loin, and flank, which more than offset some slight declines in value for the brisket and short plate. Now, overall prices for fed cattle and box beef values have generally held steady compared to last week and are tracking well above where prices were at this time last year. Tyler, also wanting to mention when we're thinking about the cattle market, what we're seeing for beef trade and the U.S. dollar playing a really big part in that. Yeah, you're correct. You know, and I think that's one of those things and one of those factors we have to consider when we look at trade. Um, you know, so kind of moving into some discussion on the, the trade side of things, I want to talk a little bit more about uh, how the dollar impacts uh, beef exports. Uh, so specifically um, um, in April, total beef exports were 260 million pounds, which was down 3 percent. That's about 8 million pounds from last year. So through the first four months of the year, total beef exports were 992 million pounds. That's a decline of 5% from the same period last year. Now, last year, beef exports totaled more than 1 billion pounds through four months of the year. 
So the lower beef exports are partly due to the strong dollar that we're seeing. This will likely continue to be a headwind for beef exports moving forward through the rest of the year. Now let's look a little bit closer at uh, beef exports to our top five destinations. Um, when we look at the, the destinations here, uh, thing to keep in mind, South Korea and Japan are typically our top two destinations, but who's first and who's second can vary from year to year. Uh, but regardless, looking at South Korea, um, it's a, a typically a top destination, but the strong dollar has definitely uh, slowed down the pace of shipments to South Korea. In April, uh, beef exports were 55 million pounds. That's a decrease of 20% from last year. Now, year to date through April, beef exports to South Korea are down 12% or about 29 million pounds. Now, looking at Japan, uh, Japan uh, is typically ranked uh, in the one or two spot there, but Regardless, April exports to uh, Japan were 56 million pounds, up 8% from last year. Now, year to date through April, exports to Japan are tracking 7% below the same period last year. That's a, uh, about a 16 million pound uh, decline from where we saw last year. Now, looking at the number three destination, which is China. Um, in April, beef exports to China were nearly 44 million pounds. That's a decline of 10% from last year. Uh, through four months of the year, beef exports to China are down 8%. Mexico is the, uh, one of the bright spots that we're seeing in U.S. beef exports. As the uh, number four destination in April, uh, beef exports to Mexico were 30 million pounds. That's actually an increase of 37%. Now, year to date, through four months of the year, beef exports to Mexico are tracking 17% higher. Beef exports uh, to Mexico are likely, higher beef exports to Mexico are likely due to, in part, to modest strength in the Mexican peso. So keeping an eye on the peso will be a gauge for future beef export potential to Mexico. Now rounding out the top five is Canada. Um, U.S. beef exports to Canada were uh, more than 21 million pounds in April. That's an increase of 3%. Now through the four, four months of the year, beef exports to Canada are tracking marginally lower by 1% compared to the same period last year. So overall, on the beef export side of things, a little bit slower pace to start the year, which is likely due in part to strengthen the U.S. dollar. Now, switching gears here on the trade uh, discussion front to beef imports. Now, beef imports continue to track above year-ago levels with April posting an 11% increase to 327 million pounds of beef imported. Through the first four months of the year, total beef imports uh, were 1.5 billion pounds, a 22% increase from the same period last year. Now, last year, beef imports totaled just over 1.2 billion pounds through the first four months of the year. Now, year to date through April, 88% of total U.S. beef imports are coming from our top five markets, which are Canada, Australia, Brazil, New Zealand, and Mexico. So looking at Canada first off, um, U.S. has imported nearly 360 million pounds of beef from Canada through the first four months of the year. That's an increase of 12% or 38 million pounds. Australia, the number two destination, their number two supplier of beef has more than doubled its shipments from last year with January through April totaling 300 million pounds. U.S. beef imports from Brazil through four months of the year totaled 285 million pounds. That's up 16%. I think the thing to note on Brazil is the bulk of imports from Brazil were in January and shipments uh, will likely moderate lower due to Brazil's lack of a beef, beef quota. New Zealand, uh, imports from New Zealand are up 21% from January through April to just over 200 million pounds. And lastly, rounding out the beef import discussion, imports from Mexico posted a year-to-date decline, uh, which were down 18% to 186 million pounds. As year-to-date uh, U.S. beef production is tracking about 2% below year-ago levels, beef imports, imports will likely track higher to partially offset the lower available domestic beef supplies. Now, switching to a little bit discussion, a little bit different discussion on the trade side of things, one of the things we don't always talk about too too much is the cattle imports. Uh, I wanted to bring up some discussion on that um, as it's an area of interest that uh, could be a factor in available cattle supplies. Now, typically cattle imports come from two countries, Mexico and Canada. So looking specifically at cattle imports from Mexico, cattle that come from Mexico are typically feeder cattle, which are often destined for backgrounding operations or into feedlots. Now in April, uh, cattle imports from Mexico were nearly 150,000 head, an increase of about 58,000 head, which is a 64% increase from last year. Through four months of the year, cattle imports from Mexico are tracking 17% higher at about 480,000 heads so far for the year. Now, looking at Canada, 
a majority of cattle imports from Canada are market ready cattle for immediate slaughter. April saw cattle imports from Canada jump 37% to just over 85,000 head. Now, year to date, cattle imports from Canada are up 17% to more than 280,000 head. So, keeping an eye on uh, the higher cattle imports from Canada and Mexico is important as it is a potential factor in available cattle supplies through the remainder of 2024. So wrapping up some of the discussion on the beef uh, export and cattle import side of things, one of the things to keep in mind from an export standpoint, you know, international demand is definitely an indication and a part of the demand picture and equation. Uh, so product that is exported does not stay on the domestic market and that product not staying on the domestic market is supportive of prices for beef domestically and also for cattle prices. So seeing beef exports track slightly lower is uh, does raise a little bit of concern as far as international demand goes. But I think as far as we look at things now, see, seeing a, a slight decline of about 5% still um, does not raise huge red flags, but I think it's something we have to watch and consider from just a pricing standpoint. And so lastly, just kind of bringing up some, some points on the cattle import side of things. Um, you know, Mexico and Canada are main uh, suppliers when it comes to cattle imports. A lot of that is just due to proximity, um, just as far as we share borders with two, the two countries, but also keep in mind that um, we are experiencing overall uh, lower inventory levels for domestic cattle supplies. So seeing larger imports from Mexico and Canada is not too terribly surprising, uh, but also it is definitely supports the overall just cow supplies and therefore uh, beef supplies as we go through the remainder of 2024 and into 2025. Tyler, I appreciate you taking the time to join us today and give us our cattle market update. Thank you. I appreciate it. That was an agricultural economist at the Livestock Marketing Information Center, Tyler Cousins. We're cutting to a short break now on Agriculture Today, but we'll be right back. You're tuned in to Agriculture Today. I'm Jacob Clouton for Shelby Varner, and we continue today's show with Brad White and Bob Larson from the Beef Cattle Institute on another edition of Bovine Sciences Herd Health. Good morning, Bob. Hey, good morning. So happy to have you with us, and and you got a great topic to discuss today because this affects all producers when we think about stress and reproduction, and logically, the answer to the question is simple. It's yes. But that's not enough information for us to make any new decisions. And, and you came up with a, a paper from 2020 that, that really did a good job of summarizing this. And it was called The Effect of Stress on Reproduction and Reproductive Technologies in Beef Cattle, a Review. And it was by several authors from Spain published in Animals in 2020, if you want to look up the paper. But I want to get your take on this, Bob, because you've got a lot of experience in this area. And I'm going to start with what, what causes stress? We think about things like management stress, so the act of weaning a calf, the within the herd, the social hierarchy, kind of the personality, you know, how aggressive are the cattle? Are they pretty calm? Are they get pretty riled up if humans or humans on horseback are around them? So those types of things. So think of kind of the behavioral aspect. Uh, nutritional stress, you know, typically we think of undernutrition as the more common nutritional stress, but overnutrition as well, or just imbalances really in the, the nutrients that are supplied uh, have some effects that go through the stress cascade. And then finally, thermal stress. And I'm going to include both kind of extreme heat and extreme cold as potential uh, thermal stress that can affect reproductive performance. A lot of the research that we've looked at relative to stress has been related to disease risk. And you talk about how stress changes the immune response, may lower our immune response. But when I think about repro, I guess I'm not as concerned about the immune response. So what, what is the effect of stress on the reproductive system? Well, I'll, I'll lead with, I wish, I wish we knew more. Um, I was really hoping to find some even additional information, but I don't think all the research has been done to directly look at the effect of stress on reproduction. But one of the things we do know is one of the hormones that is elevated in times of stress is cortisol. And we, we have found that cortisol has some direct effect on the hypothalamic pituitary axis. And so we see things like uh, higher cortisol levels are associated with less GnRH secretion by the hypothalamus, uh, lower LH and FSH release by the pituitary, and lower steroid production by the 
uh, gonads. We even also, at least a few papers, have looked at uh, receptors, like steroid hormone receptors in target tissues are downregulated in times of stress. So if we think about, you know, back to our understanding of the control of, of estrous cycles, the control of uh, gametes, both eggs and sperm production, uh, that hypothalamic pituitary axis, so GnRH to LH to steroid hormones, is really critical, and it appears that several steps along that pathway are negatively impacted by cortisol and possibly other mediators of stress. So when we think about kind of managing that or controlling it, stress is not stress. And I'm getting at the duration yes. of the stress. Yes. And how does that impact that HPA regulation? Yeah, it certainly appears that acute stress, it comes and goes. So putting a bull on a trailer and moving him, yes, he's going to have some higher cortisol levels. He's going to express some of the signs we think of as stress. But as soon as he's let loose and out in the pasture, that comes back down to normal pretty soon. Those don't seem to be particularly uh, negatively affected or affecting reproduction. Or at least we can't identify a, a good correlation. We're really more concerned about more chronic stresses. Um, and so... Things like prolonged environmental stress, prolonged nutritional stress, or, and sometimes it might be, and this is where we don't have as much research, some of that hierarchy uh, issues. So either on the male or female side, if they're low in the pecking order, the hypothesis is maybe they have elevated cortisol if they're kind of constantly, they know that they're at the bottom of the pecking order. We see that in some other species as well. That's why we think it's probably true in cattle as well. So there may be some of those. Those are a little bit harder to deal with, but certainly um, climate stress, nutritional stress, and and when we handle cattle, um, good good low stress handling, I think, are all kind of things we can think about uh, to try, try to avoid the reproductive ramifications. And basically, it's it's changes to that hypothalamic pituitary axis and sometimes i wonder yes that's true there's an effect is it a big enough effect that it changes let's say either bull fertility or cow conception rate good question and and there's i'm going to answer it in two different ways one is if we think about kind of typical beef cattle natural service situations where uh, cows and bulls are out on a pasture the stresses that we might run into are nutritional stress or thermal stress or you know usually high temperatures possibly low temperatures or uh, nutritional restrictions and yeah that can have an effect on fertility through this hormonal pathway uh, we see poor quality gametes we see uh, shorter duration or at least less mounting activity uh, when we have some of the effects of these types of stresses so yeah that can affect natural service matings, but honestly probably needs to be relatively chronic and, and relatively severe. Not, you know, so a, a short-term, short-duration stress that's pretty minor. If it's causing reproductive losses or reduced fertility, it's hard to detect because it's not a lot. Hauling the bull to the breeding pasture and having him start breeding, pr probably not a big deal yeah. in terms of what we're talking about here. Right. Now, I'm going to leap to another topic, though. When we do artificial insemination, embryo transfer, those types of things, a couple of things are different. First of all, humans are handling the cattle. So we're working them through facilities. We're gathering them. They're standing. Uh, so, you know, I think about thermal stress. If we've got them gathered, you know, where are they? Are they in a, in a place where they can maintain, their, you know, their thermal neutral zone? How are the humans gathering them? Do we increase uh, or, or not increase the level of stress in those cattle by the way we handle them? And because we're using artificial insemination or embryo transfer or something like that, some of those things that are probably a little bit harder to pick up in a natural service um, mating situation, we think we can detect some differences when we use um, advanced reproductive technologies. In that, well, it's coinciding with human activity. And so now, now that the human activity starts to become really important. So let's, let's talk about the advanced repro technologies and the impact of stress there. Artificial insemination could be embryo transfer, many of those that are out there. This article had a section talking about the impact of stress. What did, what did they find was maybe some of the important factors? Well, a couple of things really had to do with um, animals' temperament. And so what they identified through a number of different papers was animals that were classified as being aggressive or, you know, sometimes it's measured as shoot-exit score or something like that. So just think of those cattle that are more aggressive. 
they tended to have a little bit lower success with either artificial insemination or embryo transfer and those types of interventions compared to more docile animals. Now, the exact cause and solution is, is not totally clear, but it seems things like, and it makes sense, uh, selecting animals that are less easily excited. So including some docility in your selection of reproducing animals seems to make sense. And we have said before, go slow to go fast when Absolutely. we talk about processing animals, but even more critical when we're talking about around the reproduction time and we want conception to occur. One of the things that was mentioned here was uh, acclimation or having cattle become used to the facilities or the people. What are your thoughts on that? In some ways, you know, the first time I read it, they, what they, these authors recommended, and they're citing some papers, is, you know, if you're going to be doing some embryo transfer or AI or something like that, run cattle through the chutes several times, not doing anything other than running them through the chute so that they become very acclimated. It's not new. And my first thought was, well, that doesn't seem very practical. But depending on the population size, this, whether it's large or small, if we're going to go to the expense to do uh, some of these assisted reproduction technologies, uh, a little bit of time of acclimation, um, probably, it's, it's something to com- seriously consider because it's a, what I'm really trying to avoid is that day when we're trying to work a lot of cattle through and we're in a hurry, so we're not necessarily following the go slower to go faster thought process and the cattle aren't used to the facility and we're struggling to get the cattle to do what we want them to do in the time frame we want them to be done. So we're running a lot of cattle through to either give them hormone injections or to inseminate them or transfer over, uh, embryos. I think anything we can do, so facility design, worker training, and cattle training are all things that we can do to at least remove those impediments to a successful um, AI or ET event. The thing that they did not, or or if they did, I missed it, overtly mention here when you talk about management stress, and it applies to all of us very relatable, is novelty. Novelty is a great cause of stress, novelty or change. And while I can control cattle handling and I can have good facilities, the only real way to manage novelty is to get familiarity. And and all of us face that, right? You see something new and it, it may or may not be overly stressful, but it's new and it's right. different. So I think what you're suggesting is there may be times, depending on the importance and the cattle type and facility, that I do want to run them through or I, I don't even say it differently. Walk, walk them, them through. through. Well, thanks for sharing. And this article was a really good summary of stress and thinking about stress and reproduction is important. I think w- we covered some of those areas, especially relative to advanced reproductive technologies. Getting them acclimated to the facilities can be very useful and, and not extremely costly. We're cutting to a short break now, but we'll be back with more up ahead. You're tuned in to Agriculture Today, and we finish our Monday show talking about eels with K-State Fisheries and Aquatic Extension Specialist Joe Gherkin. Joe, thanks for joining us today. Thanks for having me back. Joe, recently found an eel in the Kansas River? Yeah, so we generally think of eels as being oceanic species, living out in the ocean, kind of having a good time out there. But recently, one was caught in the Kansas River, and historically, we've known that they've been there. But some members of the Kansas Department of Wildlife and Parks Aquatic Invasive Species crew was out recently uh, and caught one in April. And it's the first one that's been documented in the Kansas River in about a decade. So I thought it was a good opportunity to kind of chat about American eels what they are and and how exciting they can be. So what is an American eel? Yeah, so an American eel is a fish, and it's a cool type of fish called a catadromous fish. And catadromous fish, uh, they go out to the ocean to spawn and reproduce, and then they drift across the ocean and swim upstream, and they grow up in freshwater systems, and they spend most of their life in a freshwater system. Uh, So American eels are long, slender fish, kind of have that cool life cycle, weigh about three or four pounds, two to three feet long. Like I said, their populations are pretty stable, but they're not really common around here. 
So what is that spawning process like? So it's a pretty cool deal. These fish live anywhere from 5 to 40 years, and that's going to depend on whether they grow up in a brackish environment, which means a mix of saltwater and freshwater, or a freshwater environment. If they grow up in that brackish environment, they're going to live for about five years before they make this cool journey I'm about to talk about. If they live in a freshwater system, that might be 40 or 50 years. They're slower growing in freshwater systems. But once they reach their adult age, they decide, hey, we're going to go on a on a trip, and they're going to make a journey out to the Atlantic Ocean to a place called the Sargasso Sea. And that sea is where every American eel that we know about spawns. To put that in perspective, that's about 3,500 nautical miles from the Kansas River that this eel had to make its journey in its life to be able to get to where it can reproduce. So they grow up, they turn into adults, they decide it's their time to make the journey. They make this 3,500-mile journey to the sea. They spawn there, and then they generally die, but they leave this legacy of all these tiny little eels. And those eels get picked up by the oceanic currents, and they're just kind of along for the ride for up to a year, right? Getting pushed uh, north, getting pushed west, until they end up somewhere near a continent where they can find some freshwater system, swim upstream, and do that life cycle, grow up, and then do that cycle all over again. So really can be found about anywhere in the country, possibly? Generally, they're in, you know, kind of the southeastern area. So they're getting pushed in that Atlantic Ocean or the Gulf, generally where they'd be found. But then they can make migration. So the eastern half, southeastern, especially portion of the United States is where we'd expect to find them. You mentioned that this is the first time an American eel has been found in the Kansas River in about 10 years. And why is that? Yeah, a big part of that is because we've dammed up a lot of the rivers that they like to move upstream in. And so dams have blocked the migration of these species. The American eel is the only catadromous species, so growing up in freshwater and moving to the ocean. Uh, we have a lot of species that are potamodromous. And so potamodromous species grow up in freshwater, and then they move upstream and reproduce upstream somewhere, and those young drift downstream. And so dams have blocked migration of, of a lot of different fish. Scientists have looked at ways to combat that. And one of the things they've done is look at fish passages or fish ladders so that fish can move upstream. Uh, But a lot of the places uh, where that could happen, we've determined that that's not the best scenario. So uh, the Kansas River is a good example of that. The Kansas River has a low head dam called Bowersock Dam near Lawrence. Uh, And they've talked about putting a fish passage in to help a lot of these native species. But some of the non-native species would also be able to move up upstream, mainly Asian carp. And that competition between those non-natives and the native species are one of the things that that we've determined, hey, the, the risk doesn't outweigh the reward kind of thing, right? So dams have slowed us down a little bit some ways around that, but who knows what the best path forward. I guess that's something we can keep looking at and learning about. So it's worthwhile going outside because you never know what you're going to find? Yeah, and that's a great reason, you know, remember to get outside, go play outside. You never know what you're going to find. So whether it's your pond, your prairie, or or the Kansas River, you never know what you're going to see. Get outside and have fun. That was K-State Fisheries and Aquatic Extension Specialist Joe Gherkin. That's all we have for you today on Agriculture Today, but we'll be back with more for you tomorrow. Tomorrow.